Hello, parents, teachers, and any students who may be well watching. Welcome to Creating Math Ahas. My name is Dr. Sandy Atkins, Sandy, and in this video, we'll be looking at the five strands of math proficiency. Now, if we were together and I were to ask you what are characteristics of a high achiever in math, quite often I hear things related to speed. They can get the answer quickly. They know their facts. They know those procedures. They are really fast. Now, that may be part of it, but that's not the only part of being proficient in mathematics. In 2001, the National Research Council Math Learning Studies Committee published a book called Adding It Up, Helping Children Learn Math. And you can see it's a quite thick publication. If you'd like more information about that, I'll try to leave a link to a free PDF that you can get. But in this publication, they identify five strands of math proficiency. Now, those five strands include conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, strategic competence, adaptive reasoning, and productive disposition. What they said is these strands are interwoven and they are interdependent. So focusing on just one or two of the strands will not necessarily result in a child being mathematically proficient. I know that the math of my elementary school years really consisted consisted of arithmetic. And that might have been your experience too. We learned set procedures for getting answers to problems, and then we used those. And I think for me, I was very quick at learning those procedures and I knew all my facts, but if I was giving a word problem, I struggled. I, I didn't necessarily wanna, I, I wasn't really great at those challenging problems. And that's what comes out with those strands. I was that child who would be considered very procedurally fluent, but when it came to some of these other strands, I did not have those competencies. So conceptual understanding is understanding the why of what you're doing, the conceptual piece, the imagery that goes with it, um, the meaning of the operations, not just how to get answers, to addition, subtraction, multiplication, division problems. So again, it's the why. So you're going to see your children maybe drawing pictures where we didn't draw pictures, maybe using language where we didn't have to describe things. So it's all trying to build that level of understanding so that when they are faced with unique problems, it will not um, stall them. Now, procedural fluency is a very important strand, and I'd like you to notice two key words in this descriptor. One is flexibly, and the other is efficiently. Um, now, flexibly, children should be able to approach and solve computation problems and other problems from multiple angles using multiple strategies. Now, when we first started seeing these additional strategies come out, um, Quite often we heard, well, why do they need to know those? Because they can get the answer this way. And, and typically the this way was the, was the procedure we all learned, right? But that flexibility, what we're doing is not teaching them all these strategies so they pick one that helps them get the answer. What this is saying is they need to be able to flexibly choose strategies. So just for example, if I want to do two times 299, I could use paper and pencil. I could pull out my calculator. I could think, oh, that's double 299. Oh, well, that's just double 300 minus two and be done. The nice thing about some of these strategies is where we learn arithmetic approaches to computation. These are more algebraic approaches. That double 300 minus two is really linked to the distributive property. So it's not just a made up strategy or something that we're just coming up with for the children to use. It's really using algebraic approaches. So the other side is efficiency. If you think about how I just solved two times 299, it was a very efficient technique and I could do it in my head, right? I know the answer is 598 because I know it is double 300 minus two. So 
just thinking efficiency is important. Sometimes paper and pencil is not the most efficient way. So you're going to see your children experiencing math in a way that helps them use more mental strategies, which again will be more likely linked to those algebraic properties that were saved for us in middle and high school. Now, the other side is strategic competence. Children should be able to understand that we use math to solve problems. We want them to formulate problems, represent and solve those problems, understand the models that we use, the diagrams that are helpful, so that they have a way to approach new and unique problems. Okay. Now for adaptive reasoning, part of it is we want children to always be looking for patterns. They should be noticing patterns all around, whether it's shape patterns, right? Patterns when it comes to measurement, which will help with conversion, or just patterns in computation so that if they have that deep conceptual understanding, they can start to tell us the strategies you can use and the most efficient ones instead of math for them being something where we show them the strategy and they practice it. It's a much more creative activity. And that's where adaptive reasoning comes in. The other side of it is also the ability for logical thought to reflect on what you're being told and explain your thinking and justify why your solution makes sense. Now, quite often we work with children who are really quite talented with procedures. They're quick with those procedures. If we ask them, how do you know? Quite often the answer we get is my brain told me or I just knew it. Now you see, Mathematical activity does involve explanation and justification. It involves considering who your audience is. And really for the children who say, my brain told me, or I just knew it, um, they're really speaking to an audience of one themselves, right? And what we want them to be able to do is think about their peers and how will they explain to their peers their strategy and how will they justify to their peers that that answer they got, that solution actually makes sense, okay? So that's one side. The other side is they need to be able to listen to their peers' explanations and justifications and decide, do those make sense? And maybe if there's a flaw in the thinking, what will they do to help their peers reconsider? Now, what you may find in the classrooms is how we debrief um, a problem. When I was in school and when I taught, typically my launch question, the first question you hear me ask the children is, what is the answer? You might have experienced math in that way. But what we will want to launch with is what answers did we get? It's much more revealing of where our students are. And then you may see the teacher record all these answers, correct and incorrect. And I tell them, try not to change your face because we don't want to give away if an answer is incorrect or correct, because that's an experience we want the children thinking about this adaptive reasoning. They need to be able to critique that reasoning, decide. So when we ask that, what answers did we get? We get to see where all the children are in our class. And then we follow up with what answers don't work. Now, what that does for us and for your child is if your child made an error in their thinking or misunderstood something, they get a chance to understand what that error was. See, if we go straight to how to get to the correct answer, they might not understand why their procedure didn't work, their process didn't work. So without putting your child on the hot seat, we're actually going to look at those incorrect answers by just keeping them up there in general and asking the class which do not work. Now, we follow up with one of three questions typically. Why not? Why doesn't that answer work? So we get that explanation to hear. Or I'll ask, what question could you ask to help someone change his or her mind? Now, this is quite challenging for your children often. Um, I've had some children just turn to, to one of the others, one of their peers, and say, would you please change your mind? That was their question, right? Some children give them a different problem that helps them get the answer. 
but doesn't help them with their thinking. So we're really taking some time here to help children think about math and make sure it always makes sense and their solution. It's no guesswork to this. So we are also increasing the cognitive demand for your children to get them to think about asking a question versus telling the answer. See, that changes the activity. Now, the other thing we do is we might ask them, if someone got this answer, what didn't they see or understand? Now, this may all seem frivolous. Just give them a way to get to the answer and be done with it. But you see, quite common test questions have children look for an error. And if you know how to get the correct answer, it doesn't mean you know how to describe an error. So it is an important part of math class and math activity for them. So you might see that type of a debriefing going on in your classroom. It might look quite different since we tended to focus more on how to get to a correct answer, but it's very purposeful in helping your child develop that, that adaptive reasoning ability. And the other side of this is productive disposition. And it's, it's helping children really understand that math does make sense. We have children quite often, I'm going to start with those who really understand the or, or can do those procedures, know their facts, that group. Quite often, that side of math comes quite easily for them. But if they're faced with a word problem like I kind of had struggling times with, I guess you'd say, or a unique problem, think about your child. Do they ask for help right away or want to do something different or change the subject, right? It's uncomfortable for them to feel uncomfortable. But problem solving is about handling what you don't know. It's not practicing what you do. It's, it's using what you know to solve a problem. So you're putting that situation of not feeling comfortable. So we want to make sure that those children who are quick with certain parts of mathematics also feel comfortable in their ability to solve harder problems without assistance immediately. That there is that point of struggle is okay. And that if you work on this long enough, and think about it for a while, you'll be able to solve this problem. So we want kids to understand that math can always be solved in a few seconds, that sometimes it might take several days to solve a problem. So you might see problems that we aren't necessarily wanting children to come home and get the answer and come back the next day. We're wanting them to work through it and ponder through it a bit. So asking them questions like, well, how are you thinking about this? Or is there a picture you could draw? Or what have you tried already? Are really helpful questions for your children to keep building their own ability in um, solving problems. This also goes with kids who have struggled in math. You know, quite often we have children who the minute they have problems put in front of them, they raise their hand for help. And so we're wanting to help them understand that it's always going to make sense. Try something, see what will work. If that doesn't work, that's fine. Try something else. So productive disposition involves perseverance sticking with something longer than a few seconds, trying something before seeking help, right? It's that perseverance and it's stamina. It's ability to stick with something longer than that few seconds and understanding it may take us even a couple of days to work through this. So those are the five strands of math proficiency, interwoven, interdependent, and it will underline all of the other videos that we're doing because we're going to keep in mind those five strands as we're looking at how to subtract, how to add, multiply, divide, what models are important, what understandings will help, what language, and what patterns help us come up with those rules.